1 Peter th- uh, 1 verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him, and though you do not see him now, but, be- but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with inexpressible joy, full of glory." obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. In Greek, there's no punctuation. And I think Peter realized that and just pours it all out as one one great outflow of expression. Last week, we considered the person of Peter and focused on the opening two verses of this epistle. But this week, we're concentrating on this section verses 3 to to 9. And in it, as I say, Peter is pouring forth everything he wants these Christians to know. And these verses are absolutely packed with truth. And in them, he touches on a number of themes, which which he will come back to as the letter develops. So we're going to pick out some of those themes this morning. First of all, praise. Peter begins with an expression of praise to God, just as we began this morning with an expression of praise. Praise him, you heavens, we sang. And he says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in everything we do, praise is always a good place to start. Nearly all the letters of the New Testament begin with the, almost the same verses. I checked them all through, and nearly all of them say, praise be or bless be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's clear that for the writers of the epistles, it was important to root what they were saying in this dual truth, that the God they worshipped The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob was also and is also the father of our Lord, the Messiah. And all of that flows out of Peter's in Peter's writings. And here he is grounding that in the truth. All that we believe, all that we are, our identity, our purpose, our hope, all of those things are rooted in this one truth that Jesus is God's Son and our Messiah, our Savior. And it's because of that truth that God has showered upon us his great mercy. And we must never forget that all that we have is only because of the mercy of God that's been poured out on us. You'll remember the definitions of grace and mercy. Grace is receiving what we don't deserve. And mercy is not receiving what we do deserve. And what Peter is reminding us here is that uh, as a consequence of sin, death entered the world. And without sin, there would be no death. And we're not meant to be mortal, but became so as a consequence of the fall. However, God was not prepared to let death triumph over humanity. And from the beginning of time, he had a rescue plan to take away the consequences of sin. And that plan culminated in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And in his resurrection, he triumphed over death. He broke the power of sin, which is death. And he became the firstborn from among the dead of a new resurrection people. And as Paul lays out in much more detail in 1 Corinthians 15, Jesus is the model for our resurrection. And just as he was raised from the dead, so too we one day will also be raised from the dead. Thank you. I was wondering if I was going to get a hallelujah there. (laughs) And this is all summed up in Peter's statement that he has caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Our living hope, our hope for today as we live, is our resurrection that is affirmed and assured one day in the future. And we know that though this mortal body will one day give up on us, we can have the hope of a new body which will be ours at the resurrection. And this will be a body, as he says, that can never perish, spoil, or fade. In other words, the bodies we will receive will not get sick or start to fall apart 
as we get older. They will always be healthy and will not wear out. And this hope is at the heart of the new birth in the Messiah. Jesus, as I often, uh, in the Messiah, as I often say, we're not born again for heaven, we're born again for resurrection. That's our hope. And Peter goes on to tell us in verse 4 that this inheritance, this promise of resurrection is stored up for us in heaven. In other words, because Jesus is now in heaven, waiting until his enemies are made his footstool, when he returns, he will bring back with him those who have already died, and they'll be resurrected in that moment. And those who are alive at his coming will also receive their resurrection bodies. And that's our future hope. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. And in the meantime, he says, we're protected or shielded by God's power through faith. In other words, as we trust God for our future, so he will care for us in the here and now until that future arrives. It doesn't mean bad things won't happen to us in this life, but that our hope goes beyond this life. We have a hope that is greater than anything that can happen to us here. Our hope goes beyond the grave. And our future glory is in the resurrection when God completes the work of salvation in us that began when we were born again. So having established why we've got hope for the future, Peter now turns to our present situation in verse 6. He tells us that rejoicing in our future hope can help us with the troubles we encounter now. Knowing that that future is secured helps us get through day to day what we're doing now. That's what he's telling us. Within the context, as we mentioned last week, the churches Peter were writing to were encountering increasing hostility and suspicion in the society in which they existed. And then, of course, just a few years later, persecution on a vast scale broke, would break out upon them. They were distressed by the trials they were facing. But Peter encourages them to look beyond their present sufferings to their future of hope. Someone asked me recently if I was worried about the heart condition that I've got. And I can honestly say that I'm not at all. And I don't say that to boast. I simply know that my times are in God's hands. He will not take me until he's ready to. And when he does take me, it will be at the right time. I have the hope of a greater future. And it's the future hope that gets me past any present anxiety. If God heals me, I will praise him. If he doesn't, I will still praise him, because my future is secure in him. And that's the message Peter is trying to tell us. Yes, we will face troubles, we will face trials, we will face difficulties, but we've got a future hope that is secure. And my suffering is very small compared to what other Christians are suffering. And Peter's talking here, as I said, specifically about persecution. And we can, you can read many testimonies of those who have suffered persecution and trouble in their faith, for their faith, but who have been able to endure through the same future hope. Our hope has to be not in what is transitory, what, not what's passing, but in what is eternal. In the next verse, Peter gives us the reasons for our trials. He tells us that our trials prove the genuineness of our faith. And when it's proven to be real, it results in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus returns. And the picture he gives to us to illustrate this is the refining of gold. And when gold is refined, it's heated up to a temperature where everything that is not gold um, and all its impurities are burned off so that what remains is pure gold. And he tells us that that's what happens to our faith when it's tested. It's like it gets heated up and then it's purified. Sometimes it's hard to take a stand when we're in a challenging situation. It's hard to own up to our faith in the workplace or at school, particularly when people want to make fun of us. It's hard to stand for justice and righteousness in a society that is hostile to our values and which treats us with suspicion. At the time, it's hard to rejoice. But Peter tells us that those things are part of the process that help our faith to develop. They're not easy to deal with. 
But the end result, he says, is that we will be strengthened. We will be purified. We will be a bit more like Jesus. Faith doesn't grow when there's nothing to test it. Faith grows in adversity. And it's at such times that those who are not genuine tend to fall away. But those who are genuine become stronger. In the next verse, in verse 8, Peter focuses our hope back onto Jesus. He reminds us that we love him, though we've never seen him. And that's not just true for those Christians that Peter was writing to in the first century, but for us as well. None of us have had a personal encounter with Jesus in the flesh. But we've come to love him. And our love for Jesus grows out of three things. Our gratitude for salvation. The revelation of him in the pages of the New Testament. And our personal encounter with him by his Holy Spirit. So let's consider those three things for a moment. We need to be forever grateful for the salvation we've received. And that's why the cross and the resurrection always need to be at the heart of our worship. It's why we celebrate communion each week. It's why rejoicing in our release from sin, guilt, shame, and the healing of our souls, and the new life that's been breathed into our spirits, and the presence of God with us now are so important that we rejoice in those things. And the more we rejoice in them, the greater our love and appreciation of Jesus will be. The New Testament. I've spent a lot of time over the last few years teaching out of the pages of the Gospels, and particularly John. Why? Because I want to give everyone a greater familiarity and insight into the life and words of, of the Lord Jesus. He is the greatest revelation of the Father. And in the pages of the New Testament, we are shown what he's like and how he acted. And the more we read and familiarize ourselves with the Gospels, the closer we get to Jesus and the more we will love him. And then thirdly, the Holy Spirit. Jesus told us in John's Gospel, chapters 14 to 17, that the Holy Spirit was given to remind the disciples of him and the words he imparted to them. And so as we walk by the Spirit day by day, so the Holy Spirit reveals more of Jesus to our hearts. As we live by the Spirit, so we see Jesus living through us and we demonstrate his life to the world. Allow the Holy Spirit to flow through you and you'll come to love Jesus more and more. Fundamental to all of this, Peter tells us in verse 8, is that we believe in him. And this is at the heart of our faith. Elsewhere it says we need to believe who he is. And that he, the things he did are what the Bible tells us he did. And that he achieved what the Bible tells us he achieved on our behalf. And as we continue to walk in faith in those things, so our hearts will be filled with inexpressible and glorious joy, he says. And so Peter wraps all this by telling us that we're already receiving the product of this faith. The salvation of our souls. We're receiving it day by day. And whilst we're already born again, our souls are in the process of being saved. Just as one day our bodies will be saved and transformed into our resurrection bodies. As we've, as we've already said, in other words, at present, God is working on our souls to clean them up, to prepare them for our future, while we rest in the hope of that future to come. And while we do so, we can live now as if we're already there. And that's the process God is working with us each and every day. So, in this passage, we've been reminded of our future hope, the resurrection that's to come when Jesus returns. We've understood that though we may face some challenges to our faith in this present time, particularly from the world, that's all part of the process of strengthening our faith. And we've seen that all of this should result in our love for Jesus growing stronger as we encounter him day by day through the word, through faith, and by the Holy Spirit. So that's why, as we finished last week, we finish the same way this week, where Peter wishes these people grace and peace be yours in abundance. Why? Because your future is sure and secure 
in him.